introduction. So the title of tonight's talk is Navigating the Caregiver Emotional Journey, Self and Other Care. And as we begin our talk, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the traditional and unceded territory of the Kwantlen, Semiamu, Patsy, and other Coast Salish peoples. Additionally, uh, I may mention apps and other resources, and I have no financial relationship with any of these products or organizations that I mentioned in my presentation. And the opinions that I give in my presentation are my own and not of any organization that I belong to or have any association with. What I hope you're going to learn today is how to be more present and get the most out of the time that you have with your loved one as you navigate the caregiver emotional journey. Strategies for self-care, some that you may be aware of already um, and some that might be new to you. Why we humans experience stress and anxiety. When stress can help or hinder our lives. And how to more effectively recognize and manage anxiety and stress while taking care of others and ourselves. I hope to give you examples, some experiential um, strategies, um, and I hope that uh, you find some benefit in the talk tonight. If any of the content in this talk brings up anything distressful for you, uh, whether they be images, memories, emotions, uh, please contact the BCPA for resources and or your local crisis line numbers or other resources that you may have. Life is a journey. From the moment we enter this life to the moment we leave, life is a journey. And on this journey, we encounter many others, those who were here before us and welcomed us into this world, those who will be here long after we're gone, and those who leave here before we do. Life is a journey. And on this journey, we meet many, some who share our journey for decades, some for years, and others for only fleeting moments in time, as passers-by sipping coffee in the background in the epic story of our lives, where we are the main character and others play minor to major roles, some as protagonists, others antagonists, some as healers, others as mentors and role models, moving us forward, forward on this path of life that does not seem to stop until our very last breath. Life is a journey and many others walk on this path with us. Some run, some crawl, some slow us down or move us faster, and others cause us to pause, ponder with curiosity and awe as we examine the road that we have traveled, where we think we are and where we think we're going. Life is a journey, and on this journey, there are times when we are helped to stand up and times when we help others. Life is a journey. It takes us into unknown territories and familiar landscapes, from quiet and peaceful backroad vistas to fast highways and over bridges and along boulders. Life is a journey, and the success of this journey is measured in many ways. Some measure it by how much they accomplish in the eyes of others, and others by the positive impact they have, their compassion, willpower, sense of happiness, peace, or contentment. Some measured by musts and shoulds, and others by willpower and self-resolve. There is no consensus about the definition of informal caregiving in the research and in national surveys. There are restrictive definitions, that focus on the hours of care that are provided or the assistance with daily care tasks. There are broad definitions. Some um, requiring level of impairment on the part of the care recipient. Some people don't identify with the term caregiver, but report providing instrumental, tangible, and emotional help to another person. There are numerous terms that are related to caregiving. We think of caregivers, caregiving, caregiver burden, compassion fatigue, 
When we think of caregivers, typically we refer to family members or professionals or paraprofessionals who provide care to children or to those who are mentally or physically challenged. The term was first introduced in around 1988. The term caregiving was introduced in 2020, which typically refers to the provision of care to an individual who is young, sick, disabled, vulnerable, or otherwise in need of help with physical and or emotional needs. Caregiver burden is a term that was introduced in 1994 and was used primarily for family or non-professional caregivers and the stress or associated emotional responses experienced when caring for the mentally or physically challenged. The term compassion fatigue was introduced in around 2015 and typically refers to a condition characterized by eroding compassion over time, common in individuals working with trauma victims. With regard to informal caregiving in Canada, COVID-19 has certainly set up new parameters and introduced new insight as well as difficulties. The COVID-19 pandemic has made us acutely aware of the importance of the role of informal caregivers, both in the community and long-term care settings. Caregiver challenges worsened with the pandemic as internal and external resources were impacted by the pandemic. The pandemic also forced us to pivot often and created uncertainty and emotional and physical challenges for caregivers as well as those receiving care. Many caregivers were unable to provide their usual caregiving activities to those outside their households. Other caregivers had to increase their level and amount of caregiving as informal and formal supports became reduced. Caregiver self-care resources were taxed. And I think we've become more aware of the interdependence and collective responsibility that we all have, as we are all interdependent when it comes to caregiving. With regard to statistics in Canada, Statistics Canada, we did a general social survey in 2018. And in 2018, so this is pre-COVID, most caregivers in 2018 were adults aged 45 to 64 years, caring for children, parents, or both. And 25% of the Canadian population aged 15 and older were caregivers. That's 7.8 million Canadians out of the 35 million Canadians that we have. And one and a half million Canadians were over the age, who were caregivers were over the age of 65. So most caregivers, this is pre-COVID again, were adults 45 to 64 who were caring for children, parents, or both. And the least likely to provide care were young adults aged 65, sorry, 25 to 34 years. And support for senior caregivers came from children, spouses or partners modifying their life or work arrangements, extended family, close friends and neighbors, community, spiritual community or cultural or ethnic group, as well as occasional relief for respite care. And we all know over the last two years with the COVID pandemic, how every one of these has been impacted with regard to our ability to leave our homes, to be present uh, with other people. Unmet support needs for caregivers has been reported to lead to lower life satisfaction, more daily stress, and worse self-reported mental health. Now this was in 2018, pre-COVID. So just imagine how much worse this likely became for most caregivers and those receiving care over the last two years. Now caregiving can certainly give us personal gratification but caregiving is not always a choice. In 2018, more than six in 10, that's 63% senior caregivers, reported that they had no choice. Senior women, 66%, were more likely than senior men, 58%, to 
to report that they had no choice in becoming caregivers. And the perception of choice seems to be dependent on the relationship to the care receiver. Among seniors age 65 and older caring for a spouse, more than three quarters felt that caregiving was not a choice. The more distantly related to the care receiver, the more optional care becomes. For example, percentage of seniors who felt they did not have a choice caring for a child is 74%, as compared to those caring for a parent-in-law, 70%, a parent, 67%, and another family member, 53%, and a friend or neighbor, 21%. Decreased choice led to increased stress. Senior women who were doing caregiving, 47% of them reported higher levels of stress among those who perceived they had no choice. And the levels of stress reported by men were in fact lower than those reported by senior women. Although there was a similar pattern for those who perceived that they had a choice versus those who felt that they did not have a choice. And 41% of seniors who perceived they had no choice in becoming caregivers reported that caregiving responsibilities were stressful or very stressful. And again, this is 2018, pre-COVID. When my grandmother, BG was ill and in and out of hospital. I recall I wanted to do my best to support her. I was bombarded with many memories of experiences I had had with her in my lifetime, good and bad. I felt overwhelmed with all the demands of caring for her and taking care of all my other responsibilities at work and at home. I felt guilt for not being able to be present with her 24 seven to meet her needs because I loved her dearly. I felt torn for not being able to be with my husband and children to meet their needs. I felt grateful that I was getting to spend time with BG, but I also felt guilt and shame for wanting this to be over because I felt depleted. And at times with lack of sleep, loss of pleasurable activities, as it felt sometimes that my life revolved around her illness and caring for others. Caregiving can impact the caregiver's mental and physical health and well-being. When you are a caregiver, it is normal to feel a sense of disbelief, denial, or anger that this is actually happening, guilt for not doing more, or about your past negative interactions or relationship with the person or persons you are taking care of, resentment that others, such as family, are not helping more exhausted as you may be spread so thin at times, anger at yourself and others perhaps for not being able to do more, shame at times for wishing you were not in the middle of this, and maybe even scared about what the future holds, fearful of losing the ill person, helpless and hopeless in the face of reality of a terminal illness, gratitude for the time you have with each other, and a multitude of other negative, neutral, and positive emotions. Or you might just have felt numb. It's normal to feel cheated of the future you had planned with or without the other person. It's normal to feel depleted, trying to put your needs and wants on hold or on the back burner. It's normal to question your faith and beliefs in a just universe and ask why, why my loved one? Why me? Why my family? Why my friends? I like to now do a little pretend act uh, exercise, which I hope will give you some insight. Now, if you participate, hopefully you will gain some insight, but the choice is yours if you want to participate or not. So if you're going to participate, I would like you to imagine your favorite sweet dessert. It really doesn't matter what it is doesn't even have to be sweet, as long as it's your favorite dessert, whatever it is. I want you to really focus on the sensations of having a spoonful or a bite of that dessert in your mouth. Focus on the taste, the texture, the smell, how it feels on your tongue, how your upper mouth feels, how your jaw, throat, 
Yeah. Jesus. How do they react to all of that? And they're nosy when you have that delicious spoonful or bite of your favorite person. And just relish that for a moment. Just for a moment long. And now, I'd like you to imagine some bitter food that you don't like. It doesn't have to be bitter. It could be bitter or it could be some other food that you really don't like. But a food item. And pretend, just for a moment, pretend that you're eating a spoonful or a bite of your most disliked food item. Focus on the taste, the texture, the smell. And really notice what happens with your tongue, your lips perhaps, your upper mouth, your jaw, your throat, your neck, your cheeks, and perhaps even your nose. And once you focus on that and you imagine that, I'd like you to now go back, please, to your favorite dessert. Go back and pretend that you have a spoonful or a bite of your favorite dessert in your mouth again. And really, really relish it. And focus on the texture, the smell. And now I'd like you to compare. Compare how your mouth felt when you had both of those different items in your mouth. What your tongue did, whether it relaxed, whether your upper mouth relaxed, your jaw, whether it relaxed or became tense, whether you pursed your lips, relax your lips, whether your throat got involved as well and wanted to just push it back out if it was the bitter item, or whether you were looking forward to have it move very gently and slowly down, down your throat and into your, into your stomach. Now the thing is this, I didn't give you any sweet dessert or any food item. You imagined eating it, yet you were Likely, if you did this exercise, able to discern different sensations in your body just by imagining it. So this is an example of what we think can affect our physical body, as well as our behaviors, as well as our sensations. And the thoughts Feelings, behaviors, and physical sensations are all interconnected. Thoughts will affect our feelings and behaviors, as well as our physical sensations. And physical sensations, behaviors, and feeling can also go back and affect our thoughts and each other. Notice the double-edged arrows. So how we think about something, a person, a situation, how we appraise it can impact our feelings, behavior, as well as our body. All living organisms have two key things in common. My undergraduate degree is actually in biology and genetics, so I love talking about this because that was the first four years of my, of my um, university life. And the common things that all living organisms have are, number one, the ability to heal and grow. The second thing is the ability to protect ourselves from danger. All living organisms, and particularly mammals, have an automatic alarm system that sometimes we refer to as a fight, flight, freeze response, which connects to our thoughts, our behaviors, our body sensations, and emotions. So let's get an example to help us understand this a little bit better. So let's pretend for a moment that I thought that there was a large brown bear outside my office door right now, right now. Well, I'm likely not going to stand here very relaxed. Probably what I'm gonna start doing is looking around for escape routes or something to protect me from the bear so that I can make sure that it's not going to harm me. I'm gonna have a hard time focusing on this talk because my ears are gonna be focused on the sounds from the bear, because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, when is that bear going to come through that door? My body's not gonna stay relaxed. My muscles are going to start getting tense so that I can get ready to jump out my window or find something to attack that bear. And my heartbeat's gonna start going faster. 
in order to get more oxygen to all of the large muscles so that I can fight or protect myself from that danger. The blood that's flowing to my hands and my fingers and to my feet slows down because my brain is thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to survive right now. Who cares if there's any energy going to my stomach right now because I don't need it. I need the energy going to the big muscles in my body. So I might notice getting butterflies in my stomach or my stomach feels really off. I might also notice that my thoughts start racing really, really fast as I try to figure out what am I gonna do in order to get out of this situation. I might notice a dry mouth because the blood that's flowing to my mouth and all the smaller vessels slows down as well. And so I might notice a dry mouth and I might also notice tension in my shoulders or my neck because the blood is flowing to all of the large muscles so that I can protect myself. I might notice feeling really, really hot because now the blood is flowing really, really fast. And so I might also notice sweating. Now, evolutionary biologists, they have a theory and what they say is that the reason we sweat, one is to cool us down, but the second part is that it actually might help us uh, protect ourselves from being caught by the perpetrator so that if our body is sweating, we can't breathe. So those are all the different things I might notice if I really, really thought that there was a bear on the other side of my door. Now, the bear doesn't really have to be there. I just have to believe that it is there for all of this reaction to happen inside of me for my body to go into this fight flight response. This response is not controlled by our thinking mind. It's actually controlled by the mind of the body, the autonomic nervous system, which involves a sympathetic and parasympathetic response, which involves adrenaline and noradrenaline being released. And it's an all or nothing response. Once it's triggered, it has lingering effects that can last about 10 minutes. And we can continue to have tingling sensations for about 10 minutes, and sometimes even longer if we don't get an opportunity to reset in between getting triggered by different things in different situations. So what's gonna happen with my behavior? Well, my immediate behavior when I encounter a threat is going to be to try to figure out if I can run away or fight the danger. I might also freeze and get paralyzed if I can't figure out whether I can run away or if I can protect myself from that danger. And others say that we might also experience a sense of flopping. So sometimes we call it this, called this the fight, flight, freeze, and flop response. So what happens in our body, as I said, adrenaline is released into the bloodstream from the adrenal glands and it speeds up the body systems. Our heartbeat starts uh, going faster. Um, and sometimes we can experience a choking feeling. Our breathing can become fast and shallow, and our head can actually feel a little dizzy as well because of that shallow breathing. Our stomach can start feeling like it is churning. Our muscles tense. The body heats and sweats. And your bladder can relax as well. And you might find that when you're stressed out and tense, you actually go to the bathroom and other people actually become constipated. Your hands can uh, tingle and your legs can tremble. You may get a dry mouth. And your eyes widen, our eyes widen so that we can better see the perpetrator and the danger. But sometimes because Typically what happens is the eyes will narrow, the pupils will narrow di or dilate, depending upon how much light there is. And so when we think that we're in danger, our pupils dilate, but the amount of light is the same. And so we can feel like we don't see very clearly and we might actually feel like we're seeing blurry. Sometimes. It also affects our thoughts. Our thoughts may race and we might have a feeling of un being unreal or detached and we might have difficulty thinking clearly or rationally. And we may have thoughts such as, I'm in danger right now. The worst possible situation is going to happen. I won't be able to cope with it. But typically what happens is we tend to overestimate or exaggerate the actual threat and underestimate 
or minimize our value. It's important to be able to discern real versus perceived threat. So if I come back to the example of the bear on the other side of my door, I really have to ask myself, what is the possibility that there might actually be a bear on the other side of my door here in my home office where there's an, there's an outside door, there's other people outside in the house, and would they not have noticed that bear before it came to my door? So it's really important to question ourselves. And it's also important to ask ourselves about our actual ability to cope with threat. Fear is an emotional response to real or perceived imminent danger. And we get surges of autonomic arousal, which are needed for the fight flight response. And there's thoughts about immediate danger and escape behaviors. Stress, on the other hand, is typically the anticipation of a future threat or threats and muscles tend and which can actually, for those people who have pain experiences, can aggravate pain experiences. And we have vigilance in preparation for future danger and cautious or avoidant behaviors. And panic attacks are a particular type of fear response. Other anxious behaviors may also develop. We may start avoiding people or places where we think the danger exists. We may stop going out of our homes. We may go to certain places at certain times. We may only go out to certain, uh, into certain situations uh, if we have somebody with us because we feel safer as long as somebody's there. Or we might leave early or try to escape uh, a situation if we actually end up going. Or we might go to the feared situation but use safety behaviors such as fiddling with clothes or a handbag avoiding eye contact with other people. It's really important that we take perspective on stress. Stress is typically the assessment of the demands of a situation or situations over the, our capacity, our appraisal of our capacity to fit with our internal and external resources. We anticipate that something bad might happen and typically imagine worst case scenarios and about our ability to cope with those situations. Focusing on our fears sadly reduces our ability to live in the present. So self-care is incredibly important. And let's take the example of a tea cup and imagine that we're at a tea party. Those of you who like coffee or another beverage can go ahead and imagine your favorite beverage. When I was a school counselor, because before I became a psychologist, I was a school counselor. And at one of my uh, schools, elementary schools, we used to have a strawberry tea for parents and guardians. And during this event, students would serve tea and strawberry shortcake to their parent or guardian as a show of gratitude for everything that they did for them. And the children would start with a full teapot and go around and start pouring. When the teapot was empty, they would come back and refill. But once everyone had some tea, they would have to wait for a bit and then go around again to ask if anyone wanted more tea. There were two types of patterns that I noticed among the children. There were those who came back and refilled their teapot every time there was a pause in the request for more tea. There were others who waited till their teapot was empty before they refill their teapot. Now imagine you are the teapot and the people you take care of are the teacups. The tea is the energy you give out to everyone. Do you wait till you're depleted before you refill? Or do you refill on an ongoing basis? Assessing what control we have over situations and accepting what we do or do not have control over is really key in managing stress. We have to accept that which we cannot change or are not willing to change at this time. And I'd like to use a metaphor again of a pressure cooker. So let's take the example of a pressure cooker. If you have a pressure cooker cooking on a stove like this, and it's about to boil over on the stove. 
What are your options? Now, those of you who've seen a pressure cooker like this or worked with one probably understand that there's a bulb right at the top of that pressure cooker on the lid. And one of the ways that you can, you can decrease the amount of pressure in that pressure cooker is by releasing the steam ball. These are your coping strategies to release the steam. The second thing that you can do is you can actually reduce the heat. The third thing that you can do is you can actually take the pressure cooker off the steam. So in life, when we're in situations of stress, there are three general strategies that we can apply. One, can I get myself out of this situation? Sometimes we can, sometimes we cannot. Sometimes we're choosing to be in that situation and that's okay too, as long as we recognize that we're choosing to be there. So then if we can't get out of that situation, we're left with two general strategies. One is learning how to cope better, learning how to release the steam for ourselves. And second, to see if we can reduce the triggers those things, situations, people, places that actually cause us stress. Practicing gratitude, forgiveness, and optimism are real important strategies that can be helpful to us. So in managing stress, identify your triggers. What or when are the times when you're more likely to get anxious or stressed? Are there certain places or people any time, any place, when you see certain things, when you hear certain things, when you think ahead about certain situations. I like to use the example of a mind bully. It's another metaphor because my brain works in metaphors. And this is from a website called get.gg and they've got some excellent resources uh, for CBT. So if we pretend for a moment and imagine a little bully in the school playground who goes around taunting the kids and has a little group of friends that follow this bully around, being entertained by how other kids react to the bully's taunting. So the bully comes to the first child and says, stupid, stupid, oh, you're just so stupid. The first child starts crying, believes the bully and runs away. And the bully and the bully's friends are quite entertained by this. The bully then goes to the second child and says, stupid, stupid, you're just stupid. Now the second child pauses, thinks, and says, I'm not stupid. I got eight out of 10 on my quiz today. You only got four out of 10. The bully stops and thinks, well, there ain't no entertainment here. I'm not sticking around. So the bully, goes to the third child and says the same thing. Stupid, stupid, you're just stupid. The third child responds by just looking at the bully, making eye contact, and then resuming play with his or her buddies. And again, for the bully, there is no entertainment here. But which child is likely to get more bullying by this particular well, the bully wants to be entertained in this situation. Not all bullies, but the bully I'm talking about wants to be entertained. And the bully is going to be more likely to bully the child who believes what the bully is saying and then is upset by it. So what we want to be able to do is we want to think about the thoughts, the automatic negative thoughts that we get in our head, because that is the mind. Those thoughts about ourselves, our inadequacies, our inabilities, our doubts can bully us. And if we believe those thoughts the way the first child did, then those thoughts are going to control us. But if on the other hand, we can learn to challenge those thoughts like the second child did and say, hey, wait a minute, what's the evidence that this thought might actually be true? What's the evidence that this thought might actually be false? Then we can look at what are more balanced thoughts, whether those are about ourselves, about other people and our relationship to them, including our, the people that we give care to, 
or family members or whoever else, as well as the world and life and so on. We can also do what the third child did, which is we can learn to ignore thoughts that we think are not helpful to us. So our thoughts can bully us, and what we want to do is we want to learn how to challenge them or ignore them. So here is a strategy, another strategy. It's called the stop technique. So when we have anxious thoughts, sometimes it can feel like life is going fast forward and out of control. So use this stop technique and just pause for a moment and become aware of your breath. And just take a breath and don't react automatically. Ask yourself questions such as, what am I reacting to? What is it that I think is going to happen here? What's the worst and best that could happen? What's most likely to happen? Am I getting things out of proportion? How important will it be in six months' time? Am I overestimating the danger? Am I underestimating my ability to cope? What would be the consequences of responding the way I usually do? What would be the most helpful and effective action to take for me, for this particular situation, and for others? And then visualize yourself coping in the situation you feel anxious about. That can also help us quite a bit. Managing the physical symptoms of stress. We can counteract the adrenaline response by practicing calm or mindful breathing. We can use visualization strategies. Some people like to breathe in blue or green or white or calm and breathe out red or any other color that you feel is, your, is um, indicative of, of your stress. Some people find that really helpful. Other people like to listen to calming sounds, music, nature. Other people find singing really beneficial, especially when they involve their whole body or going out into nature. And there's an interesting new prescription. It's called PARCS, P-A-R-X. And it's an initiative of the BC Parks Foundation, which is and is led by health professionals who want to improve their patients' health by connecting them to nature, better health, and well-being. Because research shows us that kids and adults who spend more time in nature are happier and unhealthier. And there's evidence which suggests that spending time in nature may lead to living longer, increased energy, reduced stress and anxiety, better mood and even pain reduction for those who have pain experiences and improved heart health. Exercise is also very helpful. And if you have physical limitations or restrictions and you can't exercise the way that you used to, do whatever it is that you possibly can. Gardening, housework, any activity that can release some of that adrenaline and stress in the body. There are also daily things that we can do to manage stress. These include having structure and routine to our days, getting enough sleep. Some people may have sleep de delay. Other people may have nightmares or distressful dreams or nighttime awakening. Other people may have pain experiences that impact their sleep or worries that can impact it as well. And there's lots of resources, and particularly on that site that I mentioned, the get.gg site, there are a lot of, uh, lot of strategies there. Uh, for sleep management. We can also seek or strengthen positive social connections. And I know that that's been really difficult with the pandemic, uh, but we have to, um, I think we've had to become much more creative uh, to try to figure out how we can continue to do that. Although the pandemic has been very isolating for a lot of us. Emoting, journaling, talking to someone about your emotions, worries or concerns. Finding creative activities that have potential to give you a sense of flow, a sense of purpose, connection, accomplishment, or mastery often helps. Exercising regularly. And other people find daily meditation and reflection time, whether it's guided meditation, and there's lots and lots of YouTube resources for that uh, nowadays. You can search for meditation, you can search for words like hypnosis, um, or relaxation, um, and there's a lot of really good people on YouTube now uh, who uh, got free resources that are available. And that meditation and reflection time 
is can be an opportunity to just be with yourself or be with nature or be with others if you're doing group exercises. But finding time for yourself to be able to reflect, to be able to pause in life, to be able to take a moment to say, what's happening here? What am I doing? Where am I going? Learning to respond versus react to situations. I think of reacting to situations as an automatic thing that we do based on our past experiences, based on the mind of the body, versus responding, I think of as something that we do when we think about the situations and think, what is best for me in the situation? What is best for the other person in the situation? And what is best for the situation as well? Using effective problem-solving strategies can be really, really helpful as well. Learning to pace yourself. Don't take on too much. Particularly with COVID, I think so many people have had to take on a lot more than what they had anticipated. Uh, as we were pivoting back and forth with all of the different guidelines um, as professionals, as well as uh, people in the community. Do things differently. Learn to gradually confront the situations that we may be avoiding. So for example, if we've isolated ourselves to our homes or um, stopped making connections with others because it just felt like too much energy, um, learn to gradually confront the things that we might be avoiding that could have potential to give us some sense of connection or calm or peace. Find time to laugh. Laughter yoga, I had heard about that and uh, never really um, participated in, uh, in, in it until last, um, last summer. There's a colleague of ours um, in North Vancouver who actually offers a free laughter yoga class monthly. And I participated in this. And I have to tell you, initially I had my doubts about whether this fake laughter, which is what it felt like initially, could actually impact my body and how I was feeling. But by the end of it, I was laughing harder than I had laughed in months. And I was quite surprised by it. Spend time with your pets, if you have pets or animals. Many people find that calming. Find moments of humor. A client of mine shared this with me. She stated that she saw it on Instagram and thought she would try it. And surprisingly, she reported that it was working for her because it made her laugh every time. It says, a new approach to self-care. Talk to myself the same way I talk to my dog or dogs. Hey, sweet girl, look at that beautiful belly. Oh, you're so clever, want a treat? And my client, she said she would laugh every time she did that, but it helped her get away from the negative thoughts or the stress that she was experiencing in the moment. With regard to stress, why do we react differently from other people? Well, there's a number of different things. We get into patterns and it is hard to change old habits of thinking and behaving. So we all have different beliefs and schemas about ourselves, others and the world or life. We're impacted by our past experiences, reminders, triggers of traumatic experiences perhaps, an accumulation of minor stressors or experiencing a big current stressor at home or work or lack of understanding about our own psychological or physical symptoms can cause stress as well. Sometimes we have medical health concerns and that impacts our ability to deal with stress or perceived supports, home and work. Family dynamics, support, lack of support or responsibilities, sorry, lack of support, increased responsibilities, family crises, this can all impact our ability to cope. Financial workplace factors, which have impacted many people over, uh, during the course of the pandemic. Workload, work tasks, being off work, being back at work, negative social interactions, changes in the workplace, changing to online versus in-person, uh, career stage, early career, retirement. Those are all factors that can impact how we cope to, with stress as compared to the next person. Feeling depleted and burnt out, that can also affect us. I like to take an example again um, to help us understand how we get into patterns of behavior and patterns of thinking and reacting to situations. I grew up in the interior of BC, and in the interior, while I was growing up a few decades ago now, there used to be a lot of snow, and there was this field between the path I would take to get to my high school and my home. So I remember when there was a new uh, snowfall, so fresh snow on the ground, 
when I walked up to the edge of the field, and my high school's on the other side of this field, so when I walked to the edge of the field, I often found myself looking to see if anybody else had walked on the field yet before me. And if I saw a set of footprints leading from where I was to the other side to where my high school was, I had a tendency to actually walk on that same set of footprints. Now, why did I do that? Well, it felt like it was a little safer if I walked in somebody else's footprints because if they were going to fall and there was danger underneath there, well, I would see where they had fallen because there would be some imprints there. So it felt like less of a risk of injury. Or even sometimes there, was, there were puddles underneath the snow and I did not want to step a water puddle because you know being cool when you're a teenager you don't wear you don't wear uh, winter boots you wore your sneakers and so in an effort to avoid all of that there was a greater tendency to walk where somebody else had walked and the same thing happens with our thinking patterns if we have gotten into negative or positive thinking patterns there's a greater tendency that when we are under situations of stress that we're going to fall into those old patterns of behavior automatically because it's just easier to do that. So if we want to change the way we react to situations, if we want to change the way that we handle situations or stress or interact with other people, whatever it is that we want to change, it's really important that we recognize that we're probably going to have to put some conscious effort in. Conscious effort to catch ourselves, to stop, take a breath, observe, then practice the new strategies, and then proceed. And we have to do this over and over and over again until that imprint becomes strong enough that there's going to be a greater tendency for us to follow in that new pattern versus that old pattern that we were using before. So we can change old patterns by becoming aware of these patterns and making conscious efforts to change them. But it takes practice, practice, and more practice. It's also important and helpful to be present. So let's talk about mindfulness. John kabat is well known uh, in the area of mindfulness. And he defines mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way on purpose and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment to moment. So let's do an exercise, a breathing exercise. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite you to take a conscious breath. Now, of course, it's up to you if you want to participate in this activity or not. But I think that if you do participate, you may gain some greater insight. So if you take a breath right now, it's up to you. If you want to take a deep breath or a shallow breath, it really doesn't matter. Just as you long as you take it consciously. So take a breath and another. And it really doesn't matter if you want to take it in through your nose or mouth or out your nose or mouth, because that's not the purpose of the exercise right now. You just want to take a conscious breath. So in through the nose or mouth. And out. And I'd like to ask you a question. Can you change the breath that you just took? What about the one that you're about to take? Let's try that again. Let's take a breath and out. So again, can you change the breath that you just took? No. If we can't even change the breath that we just took, what makes us think that we can change something that happened an hour ago, a day ago, a week ago? or even years ago or decades ago. We can't change what happened, but we can change whatever the consequences are and how we're reacting to them. 
And what about the breath that we're about to do? How much control do we have over it? Well, let's just try it. So see if you can control the breath you're about to take, not the breath that you're taking. The breath that you're about to take. I think what you'll notice is that you can prepare yourself in terms of how you think you want to take that breath when you're going to take it. But you actually can't control it until it becomes this breath. So let's just try that. So breathing in now. And out. And focusing on this breath. And this breath. This breath. The breath that you've just taken is the past. The breath that you're taking right now is the present. And the breath that you're about to take is the future. We cannot change the past. We can prepare ourselves for the future, but we can have more impact on what is happening right now. So all we have control over is the present breath and this breath and this breath. So the present is a breath you're breathing. The past is a breath you just took. And the future is a breath you're about to take. If we are present, our full energy is engaged. So I used to do some kickboxing long before pandemic. And I remember with kickboxing and any other sport, if you think about it, or even music or any other activity that you really, really enjoy. The more present we are, the more we can prepare. So if I was kickboxing and getting ready and my pose is probably not correct anymore, but if I was getting ready, I'm gonna to be totally prepared. My whole body is going to be totally present. And if I'm totally present, I'm going to be able to weave left and right in whatever way I need to in order to watch out for the bows and also Get in the punches. So I'm not saying that you should all become kickboxers or that we should all be kickboxers. I'm just giving an example about the importance of being present. So we can also breathe mindfully to anchor ourselves in the present moment when we're feeling overwhelmed or anxious. Now, some people say you should breathe through the nose or focus on the nose. Others say the chest, others say the belly. Oh, really? If you want to anchor yourself, it really doesn't matter as long as you're able to focus on the breath. So let's just try that for a moment. So I'd like you to just focus on how you're breathing right now and see if you can breathe through the nose for just a moment. Okay? So just allows you, allow the breath to come in through the nose. Now, if you have the flu or something, you might find this difficult, and that's okay. Uh, but see if you can just breathe in through the nose. And what you want to do is you want to focus your energy right here at the tip of your nose. Now, when I did some Vipassana training, which is like 10 or 12 years ago now, they actually had us focus for three days from morning till night. I think we got up around 4.30 in the morning and went to bed about nine o'clock at night. So in the group activities that we did, they actually got us to just focus on how the breath was coming in through the nose and leaving the nose. And what you might notice is that the breath comes in cool and goes out warm. And that is more likely to happen in the wintertime, of course, depending on where you are. So just focusing on how the breath is coming in through the nose and leaving the nose. Now your mind is going to want to get distracted by thoughts, get distracted by sensations in your body, maybe get distracted by sounds that are happening around you. And very gently, non-judgmentally, as John Kabat-Zinn says, just bring your mind back to the breath. Just keep bringing it back with kindness and compassion and gentleness. So your mind is going to wander because that's what minds do. 
you just gently bring it back and you can practice this at night time when you're trying to go to sleep and your thoughts are all over the place or at any other time that you want to. Just keep bringing it back. So first time you focused on the nose. Now what I'd like you to do is just change your focus. And instead of how the breath is coming in and out of your nose, I'd like you to switch your focus to how your chest is moving with the breath. And just become aware. Just become aware of how your chest is expanding or contracting with the breath. That's it. That's it. And now, move your focus to your belly and see if you can notice if your belly is moving with the breath. Breathing in, belly typically expands. Breathing out, belly typically contracts and centers itself. So just focus on how the breath is going into the belly, moving your belly up and down. Now you might notice that it's easier for you to focus on one or the other. So just become aware right now, which is easiest for you? Is it easiest for you to focus on your belly and how the breath is moving your belly? Or is it easier for you at your chest? Or is it easier at your nose? So what is best for you is whatever is easiest for you. So focus on whatever is easiest for you. And what might be easiest right now might actually be different in an hour, might be different tomorrow, might be different next week. So it really doesn't matter. What you want to do is you want to take these strategies and you want to individualize them. You want them to fit you. If we want to center ourselves and you're sitting or you're lying down or you're standing, you can also anchor your mind to however Whatever it is that is holding you up, is holding you up. So I'm standing right now. So I'm going to focus on how my feet are touching the carpet underneath my feet. And just take my awareness there. But if you're sitting, you can focus on how the chair or bed or seat or whatever it is you're sitting on is holding you up. And so that can also be an anchor for us when our thoughts are wandering all over the place or our emotions are taking us all over. So these are strategies that we can take and individualize for our own selves. We can also become mindful of sounds. So there are strategies where we don't focus on the breath, but we actually focus on the sounds around us. Or we can focus on our thoughts or sensations in our body. And the idea is to be aware, yet not add emotion, not to be emotionally reactive to them. So to be able to be perceptive of the sounds that are coming in through our ears, but to not judge them, to not react to them, or to be aware of the sensations in our body and not to judge them, not to react to them, or to be aware of our thoughts. Because thoughts, thousands of thoughts come into our head all day long. And thoughts are not fact. So often we think thoughts are fact. But a lot of times, thoughts are based on partial facts or no facts at all. So sometimes when we're learning to ignore negative thoughts that we think are not helpful, it is helpful to practice mindfulness. And there's lots and lots of resources on YouTube as well as various um, websites. And I highly recommend uh, searching for John Kabat-Zinn on YouTube uh, for mindfulness strategies. He's got a... Um, 29 minute um, body scan exercise that many of my pain clients, um, as well as clients who have anxiety and depression or just stress in general, find really, really helpful to get reconnected back with their body. So be as fully present as possible with others. So sometimes we think we are present until we discover that we're not. And you know what, in our, in our lives and, and as the decades catch up, and um, the decades accumulate on the timeline of my life. I learn more and more with each decade and I have more and more examples of uh, real life experiences. I remember a few decades ago when one of my children was around 16 and my routine at that time, because I was working full time, I was a mom working full time, had teenagers and there was just so much going on at all times. And my routine used to be, I would come home and the first thing I wanted to do was make my chai tea. I'd put my pot of water onto the stove. And then I'd prep the dinner because I was the 
delegated and um, I think the best cook in the family. So I was doing the cooking. So I would prep the meal, still have my work clothes on with my tea there. And then what I would do is as soon as my tea finished and it was ready to be, to be sipped on, I would um, run upstairs, change my clothes, get into my nice relaxed clothes, come down and then enjoy my tea and put on the dinner. So that was my routine. So this one day I'm standing at the counter, I'm chopping away, chopping at the veggies. And my brain is on all the reports that I have to do because I had some deadlines coming up. So I'm trying to think about all these reports. I'm also focused on this tea that I'm trying to make. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna make for dinner and prepping for it. And one of my children, uh, she comes over, she stands at the counter next to me and says, mom, yep. Um, she said something and I said, yeah. And she says, is it okay uh, if, I, I, if I do that then? I said, of course, not a problem. And she paused, said, are you sure mom? Of course, not a problem. Yes, yes, please. Go, go, go ahead, thank you for asking. And she paused again and she says, mom, are you really, really sure? Because it sounds, sounded like she actually was looking for a no uh, and thought I was gonna give her a no. And I said, well, of course, hon, no, no, no problem. She says, mom, I don't think you heard what I was saying. Because of course, my mind was on my reports, on my tea, on food and everything else. And I said, well, no, no, of course I heard you. Of course, it's quite okay, not a problem. She said to me, mom, what did I just say? And my brain went blank. And I paused and there was nothing there in my brain. I had not heard what she had said. I thought I had heard it. I had not heard what she had said. And I often think of that example. When I think about how much attention am I really paying when I'm trying to multitask, when my brain is off, trying to figure this out, this out, this out. And often what happens with our brain is it keeps either going into the past or going into the future. And we have a hard time being present. So be as fully present as possible with others and your loved one as your caregiver. It will help you and it will help your loved one as well. Be aware of your expectations of yourself and others. Are they realistic? Delegate tasks when possible. Practice assertiveness and boundary setting. Ask for help. Some of us have a real hard time asking for help and we may have lots of different reasons, lots of beliefs about ourselves, beliefs about other people and beliefs about uh, getting help from others. Um, and sometimes we think it's a show of inadequacy. Other times we think that others aren't going to help us, but ask for help. Give yourself permission to not have to be superhuman. You don't have to be super caregiver. You don't have to be super mom or super dad or super guardian or super worker or super every, anything. There are times in our life when it's okay to get that 99% A and other times it's okay to be satisfied with the 80% A because universities, I went to UBC and they gave an A if you got above 80%. So I try to remind myself that. When I'm feeling stretched, I ask myself, am I trying to get that 99% A? Or is it going to be okay if I just go for the 80% A? And some days, you know what? Some days I'm just going for a pass because that's all that I can manage. And particularly if you've had the flu, if you're not feeling well, you haven't had good sleep, things just aren't going very well. Really important to look at our expectations of ourselves and others as well. Make a vision board. Some people find that really, really helpful of their personal self-care goals. And there's lots of strategies for doing that. There are apps that people use for that. Um, there's also, uh, YouTube has a lot, lots of references for that as well. Um, and there's some guided meditations uh, to do that as well. And when I'm making a vision board, I try to think three years ahead of time and say, well, what, what do I want my life to look like in three years? What are the goals that I'm setting for myself? And they say it's important to actually then look at those goals on a daily basis to remind ourselves so that we can stay focused on those goals. Sorry, that was my water. So does anxiety and stress disappear? <laughs> anxiety and desire are two sides of the same coin. I've been told that this is a Japanese phrase. And so 
when we desire something to be different, it's common for us to feel anxious about it, for us to worry about it. And sometimes those are good situations we're looking forward to, a wedding, a birthday, um, a birth. So anxiety is just our mind, our body prepping to tackle something that might that we are anticipating in the future. And when we desire something, our body is going to get prepped to help us tackle that. But too much anxiety can actually paralyze us as well. So it's really important for us to be able to check ourselves and check in with ourselves. We don't want the anxiety response to be zero because caution is very important. And anxiety helps us prep for upcoming tasks and challenges. And too much anxiety can paralyze us and reduce our ability to be present and deal effectively with situations. And hey, I've got an example for that as well. Fourth year genetics. There I was, little teener. Uh, we were supposed to do an overhead presentation back in those days and we didn't have PowerPoint yet. So we had those old forehead projectors and you had these clear plastic sheets that we used to use. Some of you may remember that. And so I had all of these beautiful colors that I had used, these felt pens, and I made all my notes summarizing the articles, the genetics articles that I was going to present to my, to my peers. And I worked really, 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 really hard, but I was so anxious about it because I wanted it to go so well. Well, I was prepared. I got there, stood in front of my class, blank. Nothing, nothing would come into my brain. I felt totally blocked. And I stood there for what felt like an eternity. And my mouth wouldn't open. And my brain wouldn't think. And finally, my instructor said, would you like to sit down? I couldn't even get the words to say, yes, please. All I did was no. So too much anxiety can actually paralyze us. And it's really important for us to check in with ourselves. A wise person said, and I'm not sure who this wise person was, but apparently was a wise person, said, the butterflies never go away. It's a matter of teaching them to fly in coordination. So we want to be able to learn to accept anxiety. And sometimes that's about the affirmations that we can tell ourselves. We tell ourselves anxiety is normal. This is the right response, but it might actually be the wrong time. Anxiety is not going to harm me. This is just my body revving up to protect me from whatever I think is threatening right now. And it's really important for us to be able to say, is there immediate danger right now? Because if there is, then absolutely, you gotta run away. You, you gotta do something to deal with that danger. But if the danger is not real, we wanna be able to talk to ourselves and we want to be able to um, assess that. And sometimes it's helpful to just ignore those thoughts if we know that they're not going to be helpful. To us. It's important for us to learn to accept change because change is a part of life. And I think we've learned that really um, acutely over the last couple of years with all the changes that we've had to undergo um, in terms of caregiving, in terms of self-care, in terms of the workplace, in terms of how we work, how we connect with each other, um, physical distancing, um, socially being alone, connecting over different mediums. There's been a lot of change. And there are those things that we have control over and those things that we don't. So we need to be able to learn to accept anxiety, change, and those things we don't have control over. This time, that you have with your loved one or person you're caring for is precious. When you're a caregiver, it's normal to feel a sense of disbelief, denial, or anger. Anger at yourself and others for not being able to do more or at systems for not providing more support to you and your loved one. Guilt for not doing more. Guilt about your past negative interactions or relationship with the person needing care. Resentment at others such as family are not helping more, exhausted, as you may be spread so thin, perhaps even shame for wishing you were not in the middle of this, scared about the future and what it might hold, or perhaps even fearful of being without this person. 
and helpless and hopeless at times in the face of reality of their situation or illness and a multitude of other negative, neutral and positive feelings or just feeling no. It's normal to feel cheated of the future you had planned with or without this person. It's normal to feel depleted, trying to put your needs or wants on hold or on the back burner. It's normal to question your faith and beliefs in the just universe and ask why. Why my loved one? Why me? Why my family? Why my friend? To have the most optimal experience in this part of your journey, the most important thing is, instead of living in the past or the future, just be present. None of us know how much time we have. Every moment matters. Every breath matters. Today's lack of action becomes tomorrow's regret. If you just do the best that you can, it's all you can do. Take care of yourself because you matter. And see if you can reframe and move towards gratitude for the time you have with each other and acceptance that life is limited for all of us. I'd like to just point out some resources that uh, you might find helpful. So these are resources, um, psychologist.bc.ca, that's a BC Psychological Association website, and there's a referral service there uh, for anybody who wants uh, to see a psychologist, and it's an excellent uh, referral service. There's also Anxiety Canada, uh, CMHA, um, I'm actually having a hard time reading all uh, the small print right now on my screen. Um, and a number of other resources. There's a mindfulness resources at John, John Kabat-Zinn and others, a body scan, mindfulness of thoughts, emotions and breath. And then there's cognitive behavioral therapy worksheets and videos at uh, get.gg as well as selfhelptoons.com. And there's lots of apps that are really, really helpful as well. PTSD Coach Canada, Headspace, Breathe to Relax, CBT Eye Coach if you've got insomnia or sleeping difficulties, CBT Thought Record. And lastly, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts and ideas with you. Just remember to breathe.